who are stressed and burned out. We have a support group where we talk to the caregivers about some of the mental and uh, emotional things that they go through while they're caring for their loved ones. We have a physical fitness session where we teach you how to do low impact exercises to help with the stress and the burnout. Then we also have a pampering uh, tension release pampering. We offer free facial, pedicure, manicure, massage, depending on the location where we're at. Sure, you can. Come, come on over and be refreshed. <laughs> and we also share a light lunch to uh, kind of sit with each other and encourage each other because nobody knows what we're going through except for us, you know. So uh, we offer this program free to the family caregiver. You have to be a family caregiver, and it's free. And uh, we host sessions anywhere from two to three times a week, from 9.30 until one. And we also, um, we're located in different areas of Memphis so that the caregiver wouldn't have to be so far away from their loved one, have to get back to them. Um, so we would love for you to come and join us at Refresh. We're at 901-236-3606 if you'd like to register. I am Shatrice Ogar with Caregivers Refresh Center. <laughs> oh, and if you would like to register for one of our uh, sessions, we host 15 caregivers per session, just so that we can love on each caregiver individually. Um, we have a table back there, and if you would like to register for uh, our program, we would love to have you. Thank you so much. Hello, how are y'all doing today? I'm so glad to see y'all out here. I'm so glad for this opportunity to speak to y'all today. My name is Laura Pate, and I'm the Manager of Programs and Education for the West Tennessee Office of the Alzheimer's Association. And um, I know a lot of these ladies up here, I know uh, that the experience of being a caregiver is one of the hardest things. And uh, at the Alzheimer's Association, we have found out that caregivers of Alzheimer's patients statistically either pass away before their loved one does, or they have a heart attack or a stroke because of the amount of stress that it takes on a caregiver. Um, it is just unbelievable, the stats. Here in Tennessee, we have over 110,000 people uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. We are the fourth uh, highest ranked in the nation for that. And if you think about it, for every person affected by Alzheimer's disease, they have at least two or three caregivers in their family, right, or neighbors. And so that's over 400,000 Tennesseans that are caregivers for Alzheimer's patients. And so we have a 24-7 uh, helpline that you can call anytime and talk to a master's level clinician just to talk about what's stressing you out, what's going on, you know, when your loved one is up at 2.30 in the morning and they're getting dressed because they forgot that they retired 10 years ago, but they have Alzheimer's disease. And so, you know, they're up all night and, you know, taking care of your loved one is a full-time job. And so we uh, do trainings for support group facilitation. Uh, I go out into the community. All of our services are completely free. We do educational programs. I do care consultations with families to talk about the things that they need to uh, be prepared for. And either from an education standpoint or I connect them with local resources like the Aging Commission of the Mid-South or the Alzheimer's and Dementia Services or uh, Caregivers Refresh. There are so many resources here in Shelby County for caregivers, but sometimes when you are working 36 hours a day, you really don't have the time to take care of, of yourself on top of someone else. And so it can be uh, a very stressful situation. And so, you know, we're here for you all day, every day. And talking about it is very important. And just ha having a place to go to that other people understand what you're going through. And so um, I just wanna say what an amazing group of women that is up here. And I'm very honored to be able to speak to y'all today and thank y'all so much for being here thank you good morning i'm ann thompson i am a former caregiver i cared for my mother for 11 years i watched her go through all four stages of alzheimer's and believe me it was challenging mm -hmm. one thing i would like to share with you as caregivers don't be afraid to ask for help you know, the people that come in may not take care of mom and dad or grandmama or whoever like you do, mm -hmm. 
But as long as they're not mistreating them and they're loving on them, let them do what they do so you can step back and get a break. Don't be afraid to ask for help. One thing that was shared with me some years ago at a conference was to put a jar, like a, a vase, a clear vase in your house and label it my help jar. List everything that you may need help with. And when people come over and they say, oh, how you doing? What can I help you do? Tell them to reach in the jar and choose something. And that's what I need you to help me do. And that way you're not kind of put on the spot. Well, I don't know. You know that there's a lot of stuff you need help with and don't be afraid to ask for help. I also served as the coordinator for a caregiver support ministry at St. Andrew AME Church. We're no longer in, in operation because the ministry kind of ran its circle. There are so many things. When we started in 1999, there was nothing out there for caregivers. And we were kind of that, it was my lifesaver really, because when I went, I was at the end of the rope. I had no idea what I was doing as a caregiver. I had no idea about resources. And I s stayed with the group. We were in, in session for 19 years. Um, the young lady, Imogene Stansberry, who gave leadership, had some health issues. So I told her we would definitely take it over and keep it running as long as we could. But our goal was to try to reach the millennial groups. Those people, if, you're, if you are going to the grocery store, if you're going to doctor's appointments, if you're doing little things, calling the, the uh, handyman to do things around mom or dad's house, you're a caregiver. Believe it or not, you're a caregiver. And so when I, when I joined the group, just to be able to have resources available, and even to learn about some of the things that mama would do to manipulate me. And I, you know, I didn't realize that that's what it was. Mm. And to learn how to not take things personal, especially when they have Alzheimer's. Mm. Um, there are support groups like uh, Caregiver Refresh, the Alzheimer's Day services and all of those. And then they have conferences all over the city. So we were kind of competing with that group and our numbers failed. But I encourage the millennials, you know, you never know when you're gonna be thrust into that position like I was. And I had no idea what to do. But even if you go and get the information and read up on things that way, when you're, when you're in that position, you know exactly what to do and you're not stressed out and burnt out. So I encourage you as caregivers, don't be afraid to ask for help. Hello, <clears throat> I'm sorry. My name is Judy Davis and I work with Alzheimer Dementia Services of Memphis Incorporated. That's a lot to say. So we just cut it off at ADS. At ADS, I'm the Assistant Development Director. But before that, I was the caregiver for my mother and I'm still the caregiver. I have people laughing that my mother's an only child, I'm an only, and I have an only. Three only girls. My father's deceased, I was never married. And so my mother, in the beginning, was caring for her parents as they aged, you know, one fell, little things like that. So mother was caring for her parents. And I was the weekend help, so it was no big deal. I just did what, that, what she said, and I kept it moving, stayed out the way. And six months after my grandmother passed, mother was diagnosed with dementia. Mm -hmm. So for approximately 12 to almost 13 years, I was a caregiver. <coughs> But I really didn't realize I was a caregiver until one of my friend's mother mentioned to me, I didn't realize you was your mother caregiver. Mm -hmm. Because growing up in the Baptist church, growing up with all them old women around me, mm -hmm. they never used the word caregiver. They said someone needs to tend to that one. Mm -hmm. Someone needs to keep an eye on that one. Mm -hmm. 
bless their heart, she's going to have to move in with somebody. Mm -hmm. But they never, ever used the word caregiver. And as I was growing up around all these old women, I never, they was, a lot of them was not married. I mean, a lot of them were married, but they didn't work. Mm -hmm. So I'm around these older women, didn't work, who had the time to be caregivers. So when I was thrown into that, and when my friend's mother said I was a caregiver, I was not the face of what I would have thought a caregiver. I was 46, I was not married, and I worked two jobs. That is not the face of what I grew up seeing a caregiver. And so I tell people all the time, I am now the face of what is called the caregiver. No longer is it the older mm -hmm. uh, female that's not working, whose husband is taking care of the money, per se. I am now the face. And I'm fortunate because I laugh, because I, I'm fortunate on the fact that I have a friend who has a seven-year-old, and we're the same age. But that's another conversation. But the idea that if I had a seven-year-old and caring for an 82-year-old, mm -hmm. so I'm caught in what is now the face of caregiving. Uh, I follow that. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Williams. I am the outreach coordinator at... I'm going to trump you on a long name. Okay. The Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at Centerstone. <laughs> I sing it now. It just kind of oh comes out God. that way. Yeah. Anyway, I represent a clinic out in Clarksville, Tennessee, that works with post-9-11 veterans and their families. We offer low-cost mental health care to this population in hopes of catching those who are falling through the cracks. And our veterans and definitely their caregivers certainly fit that bill. Um, a lot of organizations can't see the family member, which is part of the reason we exist. Um, helping anyone often takes a team and it's gonna take that family structure as well. Our caregivers, as we've heard, are stretched thin. They're stretched so thin that they don't have time necessarily to make their own appointments, to get their hair cut, to get those facials. I don't either and I want one. <laughs> So we are moving into the Memphis area, hoping to share our telehealth services. If you can't get to a clinic or you can't get somewhere where you need mental help or just a chance to talk to anyone, all you're going to need is a device, a phone, a computer, a tablet. In today's world, most of us have those things. So we are trying to break down that barrier to care, be a source of support. Um, we will also offer case management services for anyone also in need. So if a caregiver were to call in, have a few sessions with a therapist, but then need help finding resources in the community, then we hope to tap into Memphis and share those resources with them and do warm handoffs throughout. Um, because I can't say enough about this population that, that truly does the most selfless work um, that anyone can do. So we just wanna reach out to this area and let them, everyone know we're here. So one of the questions, and y'all can keep the mic, um, is what are some resources that are out there um, within your organization, like specific programs that you provide um, or connecting opportunities for other organizations that you partner with that might be valuable information for the folks that are here? Okay, I'm gonna start first. Uh, if you look in your chairs, you see that I left some materials for you. Um, <clears throat> One of them is the support, the idea about the support groups. We at Alzheimer's Dementia Services, we're a therapeutic, therapeutic day program. We don't like to call it um, daycare because we are dealing with adults. So as a therapeutic day program, we work with other organizations to bring in art therapy, pet therapy, music therapy, uh, chair ta chi conversational Spanish. These are some of the things that we bring to our friends. We call them friends, not patients or clients because they don't stay in our organization. The word friend is endearing. So it sounds like someone really has your back and they care for you. So we provide these additional opportunities for our friends 
to have a day that has value, okay? And as I say that, some of the organizations we work with, like I call on Laura Pate constantly because there are things in the community that I hear about or I feel that is worth both of us working together as a unit to give the caregiver the resources that would be beneficial. Uh, for instance, like this evening, we would be at Mississippi Boulevard for their caregivers conference. And so when I was asked, I said Laura name. So it's those type of opportunities that I feel that we need to help instead of being separate. I look at us as a unit because as a caregiver, as she, as Laura mentioned, you have, and as was mentioned here, a 36 hour day. 24 hours to care for the person that is the one that you love and then 12 hours to try to get in what you need. And so we at Alzheimer Dementia Services, in our care, in our support groups, not only are they just support groups, but our support groups might also be combined with bringing in someone to talk about like the VA. The VA has been there to talk about their services and what they provide because we are, we, uh, are a provider of, we receive um, VA veterans to come to our service that has dementia. We are also a recipient of choices. So we have those type of services to come in so the caregiver knows what other additional services that they can be a recipient of. We just recently had the Aging Commission come in and talk about what they have. And if you look, there's a cheat sheet to let you see that they recently have some money available. Now, it's not uh, income-based. This is caregiver-based. What is your stress level and what can the Aging Commission assist you with? And they have, um, surprisingly, like I didn't even know, that the Aging Commission if you're a caregiver and you're stressed and you need assistance, they can help you with pest control. Things like that, that I didn't know that is here, that we provide these type of speakers to come to our support groups to help the caregiver know things that's beyond what we already think we know. We think we know, but is it correct? The other question I have, um, are there opportunities, and, and this is for like the people who are current caregivers and former caregivers, um, we know that there are times that you feel that you were tired and you've done as much as you can do, um, but you can't go on. Can you share with us some of the good times though that you've had um, dealing with that loved one um, that makes it feel like it's worthwhile? Uh, being a former caregiver myself, uh, working as a home health person, home health nurse, um, caring for um, those who are really depending upon you on a day-to-day -day basis, what has been rewarding for me is when a person tell you, I couldn't have done this, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to live without you um, in your assistance and you helping me in my day-to-day -day life. I think I would have um, passed away by now is what he said to me, you know. So that was very rewarding for me to be able to help someone else live and do what they could no longer do for themselves. Um, with my mother going through the Alzheimer's, uh, there were the, the low times and then there were fun times as well, even though she had Alzheimer's. And people would say, well, why are you laughing about that? Because it was funny. My mother was a nurse. And um, before I realized what was going on mentally with her with the Alzheimer's, she would ask me, uh, she used to work at the Y, and she'd go in, t in time to help with the children at the Y at the daycare. She'd help with breakfast and she'd help with lunch and then she'd be gone. And she says, Ann, did you feed the children? And I said, huh? She said, did you feed the children? It's time for their lunch. And then they need to go down for their naps. And it clicked in my brain. I says, oh yeah, yeah, I fed the children. You know, 
And when I go to the support ministry, I say it's almost like you have to tell a lie, mm -hmm. you know. But you know, and they 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 share with me in the support ministry. Well, it's a good lie, Anne. You know, God's not going to be mad at you for that. Mm -hmm. You know, there were times when she called me her mom, mm -hmm. and I'd answer. And the funniest thing was I went out of town one weekend, and my daughter was there helping her, staying with her. And when I came in the door, she says, Mama, I need some tape. I said, tape for what? She says, Grandma just did an ampedexomy, and she need, to, she need to tape the patient up. I said, what? She says, she need to tape the patient up. So I went in the room, and I says, Mama, I heard you had to do an appendectomy. The, the patient is in recovery, and she's doing fine, yeah. and all is well. And she <laughs> says, is she? I said, yeah, she's good. And my daughter said, oh, Mama, I'm so glad you came, because I would have had everything taped up around. <laughs> so, you know, even in the in the sad moments, yeah. there, were, there were funny moments, you know. And um, with the caregiver support ministry, when I was a part of that, just just giving me that strength to carry on you know we had families there we had one family there were 13 siblings and only one person was caring for the mother we had a we, we called these families our poster families the other family there were eight children they had monthly meetings every month they scheduled times for the children to be with their mother and it was so it, it well it was kind of sad when the when their mother died she was 104 years old and i think it was well after the funeral one of the young lady her daughter helen called and she says oh and i'm so no i called her to check on her and i says well helen how's mom doing she says oh i'm so sorry mom passed i said what she says i thought i called you I said, no, I don't think you did. I says, now you know if you had called, we would have been there. But that family sent us a, a, a note and thanked us because we were, the support group was an anchor for them. You know, we were there to, we brought in people who could share information, the Alzheimer's Association were there all the time. And one of the things that that I really enjoyed with them was the, what's the, when we had you come in and do that little, oh, dementia the, the dementia sensitivity. It, it's something that I think every caregiver should go through if you can, because it's, a, it's an activity where they do things to you so that you will be in that position of the person with dementia. And it's amazing how they put these headphones on your ears, they tape up one of your thumbs, <laughs> and then they give you all of these instructions. There's some noise in this earphone, and you have these glasses that kind of blurs your vision. And they give you three instructions, things to do. And so you're in this kind of darkened room, and you're trying to concentrate on everything they told you to do. But it's a reenactment of what that person who has dementia is going through. So it gives you a, a better understanding and helps you to be more patient with them because this is what they see and what they hear. And we're expecting them to do something totally different. And, and, and one of the other things that I learned was be where they are especially with the Alzheimer's. If they say today is Friday, let it be Friday. If they say Christmas is next week, let Christmas be next week. It's all right. It's not going to hurt anything. But when you when you try to tell them, no, Mama, today is Monday, it frustrates them. And so they're frustrated. So just be where they are, wherever they are. We were in, in Wrigley's Field one evening in Mama's bedroom at the baseball game, and she said, did you buy the popcorn? I says, no. She said, well, you gotta go get some popcorn. So I went in the kitchen and I popped some popcorn and came back and we were watching the baseball game in Wrigley's Field in her bedroom. So, you know, you just have, it, it, it's, it's a very rewarding experience. It's, it, it tires you out, it wears you out, but what better place than to be taking care of your loved ones? 
you know, helping them through whatever they're going through, whether it's dementia or whatever the, the situation is. I just, you know, it, it was quite rewarding. And like I bless you, I'd do it again if I had to. So those were some of my experiences. Well, Miss Ann, I forgot the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Why are you there? Uh -huh. yeah. No, um, she said something, and I really did because my brain is fried. What is the question? Because she said something that I was going to kick off. Well, what's the, see, led into kind of the next thing, but what's rewarding about the experience? What are some like fun time things? Okay, there? okay. Yeah. So, if I can remember that. I'm going to uh, piggyback off what Ms. Ann mentioned about uh, what we provide. We provide what is called Dementia Sensitivity Experience, or DSE. We will be doing another one. We do it twice a year. The next one we will be doing will be January the 8th from 9 to 3 o'clock at Dorothy's Place, which is 3185 Hickory Hill. As Ms. Ann lovely explained, we alter your senses for about five minutes. And as we alter, we give you uh, glaucoma. That's where she mentioned the glasses. Because if you think about it, those with Alzheimer's dementia have what's called a snapshot view. If you put your uh, hands on your eyes like this, this is how what they see. Just what's immediately in front, okay? So that means if you come up on the side of them, that's why they get startled or uh, aggravated because they're losing their peripheral, okay? Mm -hmm. Coming behind them does not work, okay? They're losing their he hearing. There's noise. That's why she said you hear that white noise that we give you. So if you're talking at them at a distance and they can only see like this, they miss that whole conversation that you just gave them. So as we take you through this experience. Oh, and we also give you uh, neuropathy. Mm. We put things in your shoes mm -hmm. so that, as you know, some people have neuropathy, some people have arthritis, that's why we tape up your fingers. So these are the things we give you so that as you go through this experience, some of it is aging, but some of it is also part of dementia so that you have a better understanding that when you're talking to them and they don't respond, that you need to hold them at their elbow and look at them face to face and be close to them so that they know that you are talking directly to them. So when you give instructions for them to help, don't give a list of things. Give it very simply. Fold the towels. Have the towels right there in front of them. When they finish folding the towels, go back put them in the closet, show them the closet. Don't say, I need you to fold the towels, put them in the closet, then I'll be ready to go. They gonna miss everything and they just gonna look at you, okay? Fold the towels, put them in the closet. You might feel like you're pulling your hair out because you've taken too long to give instructions. But in the meantime, you are giving them the opportunity to feel like they are contributors to the house. They feel like they are doing something of value, that their day is worth something, that they feel, okay, thank you for allowing me to do this. Thank you for giving me meaning, okay? Now, back to the question. <coughs> Don't forget, January the 8th, Dorothy Place, nine to three, okay? Um, as a caregiver, I never thought that I would be a caregiver after m grandmother and papa passed. I just thought the relationship that my mother and I had would be different and that we're, the child is off to college, she has now got married, mother and I are no longer just being the parents. Mother don't have to help me with my daughter by picking her up while I'm at work. We're now going to have that different type of mother-daughter relationships. We're now older adults at a different place. But she has dementia now. And it was a struggle with her to accept where she was, being an educator, and then having 28 years of perfect attendance, 
that didn't touch me either. But we did not have the relationship I had hoped. We have a different relationship that I'm hoping has made me a better person. That as I have grown from working and loving and learning and understanding, I'm hoping that I will be a better person, a better coworker, a better understanding mother, a more tolerant grandmother. But I got two knucklehead grandsons, so I'm gonna have to work on that. But this disease has taught me more patience. You hear people laugh and say, well, you got the patience of Job. Well, it took me a minute to get there. And now that I'm here, I hope that my character and my life will be a better light for those who need help. Because I laugh and when you think, well, you grew up in the church and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, 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 whatever. It takes the journey to understand how to be a better person. And I, as I'm on this journey, because sometimes I do get burned, you know, you get burned, be, whoop, whoop, this wasn't a good day and life was really sucked right here. I've, I uh, have moments that even though that happens, recently mother was singing Christmas songs. Okay, that made me feel good because Christmas was something that we as a family enjoyed and embraced. That means she's feeling at this moment that her life is at a good place. So she broke out singing Christmas songs. I broke out playing the piano and singing Christmas songs with her. Take the pot off the stove and enjoy her where she was at that moment. So yes, we've had some bad spots. We've had some ugly spots, but I embrace those moments that we have that are good mm -hmm. because I know as the disease began to take more of her away from me mm -hmm. because every day I'm losing her yeah. and as I lose more I want to remember the good days because there will be a time when my mother will be possibly bed bound mm -hmm. and there will be a time when I will lose her and being an only child and not married, I would be by myself pretty much. Mm -hmm. Unless you include those in, in, them two knuckleheads I was talking about. <laughs> but the reality of it is I need to remember this now because there will be a time when I won't have nothing but memories. So I, um, I want to add to that. Uh, one of the uh, services that the Alzheimer's Association provides is information referrals and care consultations. And um, I've been personally touched by Alzheimer's disease. My mama Juanita passed away, uh, I guess, two years ago now. And um, I'm from Alabama. And so when we were going through finding out that she had Alzheimer's disease, we were all very shocked. And it was around maybe 2013. And we didn't really know much about Alzheimer's disease at the time. And it was definitely a, a big learning process. But for me, being able to come at a point for like being empathetic, I understand what it's like for families to be like, to be questioning, well, does she really have Alzheimer's? Maybe this is something else. Mm -hmm. And and be like, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's just, maybe she's just not having a good day. Maybe she's just, you know, grieving because she just lost her son. But she is having some traumatic things happen to her. You know, making those excuses and being, you know, floating down the river of denial. And that's one of the hardest things when you're dealing with Alzheimer's disease is the denial aspect. Mm -hmm. And for me, one of the best services that I love and I really enjoy doing is doing care consultations with families. And so basically I sit down with them and I say, what's going on? Tell me how long this has been going on. You know, what is your support system? What are you doing to take care of yourself? And, um, and it's, it's rare for a man to, to call me and say, I, I need help. I need to talk to somebody. And, and I was like, okay, well, I'm very, yeah, please come by my office. Let, let's, let's talk about this. And 
this was several years ago. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say his name is Bill. So Bill came by my office and he was really ticked off. He was really mad because he had all these grand plans that after he retired with his wife, that they were gonna travel the world. They were gonna sell their house, gonna get an RV, and they were just gonna live it up. And he was two years away from retiring and his wife was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. And so, you know, she's not even uh, 60 yet. I think she was probably 52 when she was diagnosed. And so he was just mad and he was really upset and he didn't know what to do. And it was around that time that I was like, well, there are caregiver conferences. We have a caregiver conference next month. And I was like, and I, I understand if, if you don't want to go because he told me that he was not going to any support groups. He didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to talk about his feelings. He just wanted to know if there was you know, available services around. And I let him know, I was like, you know, it's really important for you to, to get out and, and to talk to other caregivers that are experiencing these things because you know, it's, it's difficult at any age. But yes, when, when you made all these plans with your wife and, and it doesn't go as planned, you know, it can be difficult. So a year later, uh, I have a, a caregiver conference at Baptist that year. And I saw him going around and picking up uh, flyers and the, the pamphlets and things. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was so excited. And uh, he came up to me and he was like, Laura, he's like, I, I, I wanna talk to you when, you when you've got a minute. And I was like, well, you know, we can talk right now. And he told me, he's like, I'm gonna tell you something that you've probably never heard anyone ever say before. And I was like, okay, I don't know where this is going, but okay. He was like, I am grateful for Alzheimer's. And I was like, Bill, are you okay? Like, are you okay today? And he was like, no, he's like, you know, hear me out. He was like, you know, when I first started on this journey, I was, you know, quite honestly, I was really, really pissed off. I was mad at the world. I was mad at all these things. Everything was changing. And he's like, you know, so Susan and I, you know, we've, we've gotten to the thing, you know, we, we've, we've got our bedtime routine, right? Like, you know, routine, structure, whatnot. And you know, so we normally just, you know, watch some TV, get ready for bed, brush our teeth and whatnot. And he said, and the other day when we were brushing our teeth, she looked at the toothbrush and then looked at me and she had no idea what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And he said, that taught me that I need to appreciate every single moment that I have with her while I have her. And that I need to appreciate my own self and my own body because I'm able to know what a toothbrush is. I'm able to tell my feet how to walk. I'm able to feed and clothe myself. My wife will one day not be able to do that. And so just being grateful for every moment that we have and grateful for our health. You know, I, one of my really good friends from high school was 32 years old and was just diagnosed with a brain tumor. And so, you know, every day is, is a beautiful blessing. And just being grateful for what we have and even hearing Bill say that, that I'm grateful for Alzheimer's. You know, it, it's a shocking thing to hear, but it makes you appreciate what you have, right? And, and while we have it. And so that's, if y'all learned anything today, you know, please learn to take care of yourselves, but also to be grateful for what, what you have. Well, I think we have gotten some really great information from everybody, um, and we definitely have some some um, questions for the audience. Um, but even beyond time for questions and answers, these folks have tables that are out there that you can get information from them, hear more about their stories um, personally and also professionally as well. Um, so we'll take a few questions. You have one? Yeah. I can't come off the stage. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay. So okay, thank you so much. I, I just, I just barely get up here. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I just want to express my appreciation to our moderator and all the panelists. Yeah, very inspiring and, and um, very in, uh, educational. And we've heard from our four panelists at the table with regard to your passion, why you're doing what you're doing, what your experiences were, but I don't think we've heard from either young ladies on each end. Um, so I'd like to know, what is your passion? What drives you to make a difference in this space? 
Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I could go a couple different ways with that. Um, I suppose I was never a caregiver because I was probably too young when my grandfather passed away. My mother is 73 now and my sisters and I, one lives locally, I live in Tennessee, the other lives in Chicago. So it's a constant battle of the phone calls of who's taking care of mom, but then again, none of us are really there. So we get the wrath of my sister, rightfully so. Um, I did watch my father pass and had a funny story. It wasn't dementia, but it was definitely drug induced from whatever they gave him in the hospital. He was a physician and he walked around the halls that day, not realizing he was the patient and started yelling at my dad, never yelled, never yelled. Started yelling at everybody in there. Why would they put the radiology department up here on the fourth floor? That makes no sense. So we had some funny moments and things like that. But truly why I suppose I got into a line of work where I'm trying to reach out to veterans and family members and caregivers alike and anyone who, who truly needs someone to talk to is because I lost two friends to suicide. Um, I had worked on Post at Fort Campbell for years. I was a television news reporter prior to that, just kind of going about my life when um, a good friend got out of the military and about two months later had passed away from suicide. That was when I decided I needed to change it up and give back somehow or, or hopefully prevent one other person from getting that kind of phone call. So I chose to go this route. It definitely reaches out to our caregivers as well. And so that's why I'm here, I guess. So me, it's my job. No. Uh, so one, some of the things that we do with Volunteer Memphis is um, the main goal is to get people engaged in volunteering. Um, but how do you get people engaged in volunteering? They have to have a passion for it, for whatever issue it is. So for me, I love getting people together that are from different communities, different socioeconomic areas, with different passions, and having to realize that even though you may live in Bartlett, or you may live in Cordova, or you may live in Whitehaven, you all know someone who may have been homeless, may have committed suicide, may have a heart disease. And so if we all know that we have that passion and we come together, it doesn't matter. My bad. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what community you come from. It doesn't matter who you are, what your skin looks like. You are passionate about that particular issue. Now, personally for me, um, I'll try again. Hello. Um, <laughs> now, personally for me, why I think caregiving is so important is that, again, like Judy said, you never know that you are a caregiver. So I moved back home from Atlanta, Georgia about five years ago. And I said, the reason why I moved back was because I want to be here with my parents as they're getting older. And so I'm here helping them drive them to church, um, you know, go pick up medicine or take them to doctor's appointments. And now I guess I'm a caregiver. They're still able-bodied and I tell my mom, she has to drive me to church every once in a while. <laughs> um, because I still want them to do things, still have their mobility and do the things they can do. Um, but I still want to support them and make sure I'm just available for anything that's happening. But even more personally, this is really about this week and next week is the anniversary of me being out of the hospital. In the hospital for six days, getting diagnosed with um, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And so I'm not really supposed to, at that point, I couldn't walk from this stage to back to that back wall without having to stop two or three times. So basically my lungs and heart, they say don't work well together, but I don't necessarily believe that. I believe I'm healed in Jesus' name. Right. So, but beyond that, I still now realize that I have a sister and family that are considered caregivers to me. So... I think this is important in talking about caregiving um, in the regards that it could be anyone at any level, at any age, that could potentially need a caregiver. I'm 40, and I consider myself young, and I go to doctor's appointments, and there are folks with um, uh, World War II hats on. So I'm the youngest person in the doctor's <laughs> office, and I'm like, I know I'm the cutest one there, too. <laughs> but I'm still, I'm still at a young age, but I still need someone to take care of me. So how do I take care of that person? And just like your, your mom was like, sometimes people are, you're yelling at them like, don't tell me to do that. And I'm like, I'm not a baby. But then I have to listen because they're trying to help me. 
So I know that I can't go off on my sister because she's like, you need to go to bed at nine o'clock. You need to do this and do that. She's probably right. So I can get up in the morning, take my CPAP off, take my medicine on time, <laughs> get my blood pressure checked, and then go on to work and do what I need to do. Yeah. So I think it's important for us to talk about caregiving because one, people don't know that they are a caregiver. Um, but then they also are doing so much for other people that they need to also then reflect on how do I take time, slow down, and take care of myself? Because we, you want to make sure that person you're caring for lives a long, healthy life. But if you're not there, who's going to take care of them? So we all have to take care of each other. So it's a full circle. So for me, it is work, but it's also personal as well. So thanks for asking that question. All right, well, we are at, I like to be a timely person. We went over just a little bit, so I know y'all, people are ready for lunch or ready to eat. Um, we're not going to eat here. I don't have a budget for y'all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey. Like that, please. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. So with Volunteer Memphis, we do have a number of different National Volunteer Day projects that we do. Um, you can go to our website at volunteermemphis.org. Um, but you can also call us at 901, wait, 278, because I don't use the phone. I don't like voicemail, so don't leave me one if you call. 901-278-0016. Um, <laughs> and then you can also email me at ahill, which is H-I-L-L. My country accent makes it sound like hell, but it's hill, <laughs> uh, at leadershipmemphis.org. Uh, and I can share information with any of the organizations that were here today. Um, but you can definitely go to our website, our Facebook page. I think we have a Twitter and a Instagram as well. Um, but definitely we want to have more events like this uh, and share more information so you are informed and then you can engage in those areas and volunteer as well. So thank you all for coming out today. Oh, Judy, just one? Okay. Oh. I'm sorry, before we go, I would like to say one last thing. As a caregiver, you need to have a team. And your team is your circle. Your circle includes those that can have your support. And your circle should include not just your family, your immediate family that's going to help you, that you have that conversation with, but it also should be professional people in your circle. That includes the doctor of your loved one. The People don't think, but you need to have the police department and the fire department in your community involved. Because if something happens to you and the fire department comes to the house, they need to know that your loved one has dementia. For example, when, the, when we had that storm to come through, Hickory Hill not too long ago, we had a caregiver whose house was split in half mm -hmm. by a tree. Now, fortunate for her, her mother was with her sister. But if her mother was at home with her that day, would the fire department would have known to look for her mother? Because if that happens, her mother wasn't going to say, here I am. She would have hit So yeah. at opportunities and times like that, your fa the fire department or the police department needs to know who's in your house, what is going on. Or for example, like me, if I hit the ADT button for help and I pass out because I'm an insulin, uh, insulin diabetic, <coughs> they need to know that when they come to see about me, my mother is in the back with dementia that might be singing Christmas songs unaware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So that's why you, the first responders needs to know what's going on in your house. And also why you letting them know and your uh, loved one's doctor know, the pharmacist needs to know that you are the caregiver. Your doctors need to know that you are now a caregiver and what's going on in your house. So if your numbers start to look crazy, they can adjust your meds, okay? And finally, if you have pets in the house, your veterinarian needs to be a part of the circle. Because if your little uh, four-legged four, uh, fur friend is in the house, then what's going on in the house affects them also. And people don't think about those uh, loved ones. 
But uh, all that was going on in my house, and me being diabetic, my puppy's on puppy Prozac. <laughs> okay? So, we don't think about them. We look at them, but we don't think about them. But what goes on in the house also affects them because they feed off of you. So, in your circle, remember you need to have those that are your family, naturally, your church, your first responders, your pharmacists, and if you have like I said, fur, fur animals, your veterinarian. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yay.